Hello and welcome to The Rob Burgess Show. I'm, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 224th episode, our guest is Tom Maxwell. In the 1990s, Tom was a member of the hot jazz indie band Squirrel Nut Zippers and wrote their hit song, Hell, which peaked at number 13 on the Billboard Hot 100 and propelled the band to multi-platinum status. The Zippers were inducted into the North Carolina Music Hall of Fame in 2021. After Tom left the Zippers, he composed for television and motion pictures. Now Tom is a writer who specializes in creative nonfiction with an emphasis on music and musicians. He has contributed to Long Reads, Al Jazeera America, Salon, Slate, The Oxford American, The Bitter Southerner, Tape Op, and AARP Magazine, among others. He is a faculty member of the North Carolina Writers Guild and a contributor to the National Recording Registry of the Library of Congress. Along with his partner, Brooklyn, Tom is the creator of Shelved, an audible podcast produced by Gunpowder and Sky. He is currently writing A Really Strange and Wonderful Time, a nonfiction book about the 90s Chapel Hill music scene to be published by Hachette Book Group in 2024. And now on to the show. Well, thank you so much for taking the time this evening. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I hope you're well. Yeah, we've been better, actually, at my house. We've been sick this whole uh, Christmas break here, so we've been fighting oh, no. a stomach bug. And uh, we have three kids, so oh just god, been making the rounds with all of us. So. <laughs> I've been there. I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it's not good. Mm-mm. I'm sure, going to try to not move. I'm, I'm not. I'm. I'm sorry. I'm going to try to not move around as much as I've been. Get all the subsonic stuff coming to the mic. <laughs> um, but uh, how was your Christmas? Great, quiet. Um, uh, good health. Uh, a new puppy. Oh, cool! What kind of uh, it kept dog? busy? We got a um, our first non-rescue dog um our the first dog that we bought together as a couple died uh in january and we got a he was a boston terrier and we got a boston terrier puppy almost four weeks ago right yeah our dog is uh 16 years old so oh wow (laughs) we haven't had a puppy in the house in a while (laughs) (laughs) He's a long-haired dachshund, um, and he's uh, yeah, he still he stayed pretty spry for his age. I've I've been surprised. So, <laughs> I've never raised a puppy, so uh, it's more or less what I expected, which is like equal parts irresistible and uh, maddening. <laughs> Absolutely. Do you anything good for Christmas? Yeah, I got it. I got an iPad, which I'm loving. Nice. Yeah, and uh, s- some very nice clothes. Cool. Me too. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah the, it's it's the sign of adulthood, right? When <laughs> when when you're excited about the clothes you get for Christmas. <laughs> I always thought old people were so like, oh, like you know, roll my eyes at them when it's like, oh, I got a warm pair of socks and a bag of coffee, and it's like, I'm like, that sounds that's my good. You have a good time right now. <laughs> that's right. It's ideal. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that, I mean, it's good to appreciate things that are a bit, you know, to assign value to things that are actually valuable. Sure. Well, the thing I got that I liked the most, I actually bought for myself, but didn't allow for myself to play uh, for several months. Was um, I was looking for a parlor guitar because um, I wanted just a small body, just guitar, just like to hang on the wall and, and pull down. Um, yeah. And I bought it at my friend Mark's uh, guitar store, and I bought this in like September. But I think I read a book about uh, huga or whatever the Swedish concept of like feeling cozy in the winter times. Um, anyway, they said that you should buy yourself presents and open them at significant times. So instead of just ripping into it, I made myself wait, and so it's been fun playing that. And I didn't, you know, I had the like waiting period of like thinking about playing it. <laughs> 
So. That's a very philosophical approach to yeah. uh, making music, <laughs> which is not making music at all. For, <laughs> I, are, I, I do have another guitar, so it, it's not like I didn't play guitar oh, okay. in the interim. I have a Gretsch uh, hollow body uh, electric, but uh, <laughs> I was definitely thinking about that guitar when I was playing the other guitar. <laughs> I mean, that's cool, though. Yeah. That must have been nice when you finally got that thing out. And Oh, yeah, it was super fun. Yeah, it's been a blast. So. But uh, anyway, thank you again, and it's such an honor to talk to you. I've uh, enjoyed your music for so so many years, and uh, it just made such a. It's been so much fun in my life. So thank you. Well, that honors me. Uh, you know, it's it is a it it's always been a source of, I guess, a little bit of surprise and delight when people you know, recognize or, or tell me that they like squirrel and zippers or music that I've made it, because you, you can't, you can't expect it. And, and it always comes, it often comes from people you, you don't know, you know, and that's, that's just such an extraordinary thing. It's an extraordinary, um, almost, it's like a paradox in a way that you, 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 you play music. So it's a very mm -hmm. sort of personal thing a very personal sort of form of expression but yet can be um can affect people that you'll never meet you know can be emotionally resonant with strangers that's that's kind of magical really mm -hmm. right so thank yeah. you definitely and uh like i told you i uh i remember vividly getting uh your uh hot album your second album in the mail from the bmg music service uh, where you could get, I believe it was uh, 10 albums for a penny or something, but then somehow the scam was that the, they then forced sent you like another one that cost eighteen ninety nine that was like a pre-selected you know, <laughs> selection yeah. later on. So they, they got their money in the end, but it was like, oh, man. <laughs> so uh, that was definitely the one of the ones that I cut out the little stamp for and put on the thing. And, uh, yeah, that was an incredible uh, uh, album. And right from the bat, I loved uh the sound and it was very intriguing and uh you know i've been listening pretty much consistently ever since it hasn't really fallen off like i have mixtapes that i have from college with scroll nut zipper songs on them and i you know when i was watching first watching the youtube video i watched the you know ghost of stephen foster and you know <laughs> like like it's just kind of been a consistent thing you know what i mean it's 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 been fun so tell me is the the version of the hot record you got, did that have the enhanced CD? Or it did. You know about that? It was, yeah, you know, I believe it would play it on my Windows 95 uh, home desktop computer. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe, uh, oh gosh, there was another one that had a Weezer's Buddy Holly video on it uh, for some reason. Uh, that was like another enhanced CD that came with the computer. But yes, I believe it was the enhanced CD version. You're right. So. That blew my mind when I saw that for the first mm -hmm. time. But when Clay Walker was putting that together, and I just had no idea. To me, it was just well. Even now, looking back on it, I'm like, how did we manage to pull that off with the tech that existed <laughs> at the time? I didn't get a a PC for another four years. Oh wow! I didn't, even, okay. I didn't have a computer back then wow. at all. Yeah, <laughs> you were on the cutting edge of technology, and you weren't even personally participating, <laughs> and in it. I couldn't even <laughs> play it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds wow. about right. That's funny. But yeah, tell me a little bit about growing up and what instruments did you play initially? I uh, was in the school band. I played trumpet and uh, baritone. And uh, in addition to guitar, uh, not in the band, but in bands, but not in the marching band, of course. But uh, so what were your first instruments? You're a real multi-instrumentalist. I really wanted to play drums, and my parents put the ixnay on that. And right. so I remember when the, I guess the high school music teacher came to middle school and showed us the brochures, and I was really entranced by the saxophones. They seem so complicated. I, so I picked up alto sax and played that through high school. And while I was in high school, and we grew up, I grew up on a mountain and and our my an elderly neighbor Rice Fitzpatrick said oh I see you're playing saxophone I used to play in my college jazz band 
in the 1920s. Here's, do you want my cheat book? And I was like, oh, I, sure, I guess. And my parents were like, oh, it was a big deal, you know. So this is a big deal. So I put it in a safe place, which is to say I just never looked at it. But when, like, years later when I got into to uh, pre-war jazz, I pulled that thing out. And that's, that was functionally how I learned how to write songs. It was just like, oh, here's a, here's a song I love, and here's the charts. And I learned about chord progressions and all that stuff. And I played alto sax through... I, I, I marched a year at Carolina to get out of a math class, but I had been <laughs> steadily accruing a drum kit the whole time and played, was in rock bands as a drummer before I even graduated. And so, and then was a drummer when I got into scroll nut zippers and only went back to the saxophone because Ken Mosier's, no, Chris Phillips' brother brought his old baritone saxophone into our first album session. And I was like, fuck me. I want to play that thing <laughs> like that guy in Cab Calloway's band. And so I was like, well, gee whiz, you know, if Ken Mosier can do it, same story, you know, a middle school saxophone player, I can do it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I did. Right. Well, the scroll nut zippers were just jam packed with talent. Uh, I was just watching a uh, concert of yours from 98 and you're just, trading off instruments and just yeah. going it was like a uh, hot potato you know it was just wild how much talent is in that band and so it seems like you all had this real breadth of knowledge and and you know talent and just you were willing to try anything you know what i mean <laughs> we definitely the latter maybe more than the former <laughs> i think the the like, you know, you, you always know where sort of where you're at on the ladder of accomplishment. And, you know, the guys that, that we listen to were so much better. I, 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 I connected with somebody on Mastodon and they had a picture of Lafitte's blacksmith shop in the French quarter. And I said, I know that place. I love that place. And he's like, yeah. And I said, my old band did a, recorded a tribute to that place and um it's called it was a song off of perennial favorites record and it's called evening at lafitte's and i play a tenor saxophone solo and i remember desperately trying to sound like stan Getz, and not not sounding like stan Getz, you know <laughs> sounding more like a wounded goose oh, no. so but the thing about there's a couple of things like if you were in Chapel Hill at that time, you had to make the sound that was in your head. There was no community of jazz players that we knew. There was no, there was nobody who was going to play that clarinet part. I had to play that clarinet part and, and wrestle with the instrument. So I, I, we always had m more enthusiasm than chops, but plenty of enthusiasm. Um, and I think mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of the saving grace, you know. I um, there are always people who are better than us technically, but I don't think that they had the same fire in their belly, you know. Mm -mm. Yes, I, I totally totally know what you mean, and um, you know that leads me into one quote from your uh, book here that I, I wanted to read part of because I just thought it was such a great summation of what I like about you're talking about the bands you liked you're influenced mm -hmm. by but i sure. think it, for, for me it could be describing how i feel about squirrel nut zippers but mm. you know it says uh as i collected old jazz records i noticed a style of music that had no apparent name it mostly came from the east coast predominantly from new york between the mid-20s and the late 30s these tunes were up tempo in a minor key and rocked like hell and then you go on to say many bands performed this kind of music and i couldn't get enough it's a kind of gleeful perdition, a threat communicated with a smile. And that's like, yes, that's exactly what I like about Scroll Nut yeah. Zippers. <laughs> oh, that's, well, you know, we came by it honest. <laughs> I'm talking about black groups from Harlem, mostly. Some, yeah. There were some very, very good white jazz players back then, but that sort of entire aesthetic mm -hmm. that you can trace back to the Missourians, uh, mm -hmm. or um, Ellington's first band, the Kentu I think the Kentuckians or the Washingtonians with um, Bubber Miley 
and these guys, um, East St. Louis, Toodaloo, and songs like that, um, Fats Waller's mm-hmm. Pipe Organ Virgin of Beale Street Blues, there's something really amazing going on. And, and to me, it was sort of like, it's sort of, like I said, communicated a threat or had a menacing quality, I think, but it may may have been more of like may have communicated more sexy times for for that crowd i don't know i mean it did for me too but uh-huh. um so i would call it harlem pop music but i don't know exactly what it is i just know that it that it's that it lit me up <laughs> mm-hmm. totally um but uh yeah I, I feel like i don't know that I, music critics i mean maybe i'm not i don't not to overgeneralize i don't feel like they necessarily understood your music totally and i think they kind of took your style as being ironic or derivative or arch mm-hmm. or sarcastic or something but i, I feel like just cuz it's a kind of based on an older style of music that had an edge too i mean i, I think of uh, i mean of course you've heard but jelly roll Mor- morton songs that yeah. are just fil- filthy. <laughs> Absolutely. Kid Kid Ori had a band in New Orleans and they would have these contests where they would go out on wagons to um to promote uh a performance. This is in the teens. This is over a hundred years ago. And the reason they call it tailgate trombone is because they'd have to put the tailgate of the wagon down so the trombone player could sit there because otherwise he'd smack people in the head, you know, with his slide. <laughs> And if two wagons, if two different bands met on a street, they would tie their wagon wheels together and have basically basically a contest where they tried to blow each other away. And oh, wow. Kid Ori had a song that he wrote that his band would play when they won, and it was called, If You Don't Like It, You Can Kiss My Fucking Ass. <laughs> so, so, And this was 1919. So, no, nothing's changed. In terms of (laughs) critics, it depends on when you read the reviews, right? Mm Because when the hot record came out, Pitchfork gave it nine and a half stars. I mean, we were absolute indie darlings. And then when it went platinum, people were like, you you know, you suck. Mm -hmm. So, but it was also a kind of a way of knowing that we were on the right track because jazz people really, really didn't like us. Well, I was going to ask you about that. Why? Yeah. Why? What's up with well, that? Well, we ended up getting some some okay, I don't remember, reviews or write-ups in Jazz Times, I think. But basically, it was because we didn't have the chops and we weren't playing the thing. We were playing what was considered an obsolete style. Hmm. That is to say, pre-war jazz, when it was still basically pop music or rock and roll, you know, dance music and not the sort of infuriating cypher that jazz became in the second half of the century and legitimately could not hold a candle to a lot of, you know, the jazz great. So they didn't want to claim us, which I understood completely. The rock and roll people were pissed off because they couldn't talk about it because we'd spend, I would spend all the interviews talking about Fats Waller and people like that. And they didn't know who the fuck that was. And they, (laughs) and so what they were prepared for was a, was a sort of, um, was, was um, sort of um, cultural incrementalism where it would be like, okay, we had Nirvana and now we have silver chair, right? That's right. These are, these are the legitimate heirs. And when we show up and we're playing shit that, is 50 60 years old um that won't do that's not good that's not sort of that's not the next logical rung on the ladder of of progress you know mm. now but the pitchfork guy talked about he he <laughs> in his review he's like um you know when you have to clean your uh, your bong and you have to scrape all the resin out and that's really hard. I don't know what the hell he was talking about, but he was basically like, then everything's cool. You have like a bitter taste and everything's cool. He goes, that's what it's like listening to this record, this hot record, because at first it's just strange and it seems fakey, but then you realize that these people mean business and then it's really fun. And he, and he, and he talked about how it was the only thing that he was able to listen to when he was riding around in the car with his mom, which I loved. I loved that, you know, um, 
So, yeah, I mean, some people, of course, were very nice and enthusiastic and positive and didn't get it. And some people were very, very mean and nasty and didn't get it. And some people were very enthusiastic and completely got it. And some people were quite critical and also, in my opinion, completely got it. Mm -hmm. But whatever, you know, you, you just... The, the the ultimate goal was to, to to achieve what you've already told me we achieved at least mm -hmm. as far as you're concerned, which is that you could you still listen to those records, you know? Absolutely. And, you, and and they're not they don't sound dated to you. Well, yeah. Speaking of which, you uh, are the writer of one of my favorite songs, Hell. <laughs> like I love that song. I will listen to Thank it you. anytime it's on. Uh it was I grabbed me right away, even before, I think I had the album before this was like a single or anything, it just like, I even when I was, because I think I got it right when it came out, uh, and uh, it was jumped out at me right away, I went to church every Sunday uh, hmm. with uh, my parents, uh, it was the Episcopal Church, and I was also hmm. a camper and later counselor at a church camp, so I had very much the idea in my head that hell was real <laughs> growing up. Uh, and it just like that song just like walloped me. Like that was like, it's like you, you come in so hot, uh, like a, like a newscaster, you know, you're, you go straight yeah. to it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, yes. it's, a, it's a great song and it's only two chords. So <laughs> that's right. It's very much in the tradition of, uh, oh, yeah. of, of pre-war Calypso. It's called a single tone Calypso. So yeah, it's uh -huh. just two chords. It's the minor one and the five. That's it. Right. Exactly. That's it. And um, everything else is up to you. You know, the the newscaster thing um, was fortunate for me because I wasn't much. I'm not much of a singer, but um, I got a lot of that from Lord Executor, who I love, who mm -hmm. was specialized more in double tone calypsos. But he was a man named Philip Garcia. It very much sounded like he was reading the news and had a and communicated a kind of urgency, you know, and uh, that song, too, I think, sort of ends up, you know, increasing amounts of urgency until it's just you're just inarticulate screaming. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> and great, just the best screaming, too, like really good. Screaming. Oh, thank you. Oh, wow. uh, oh, and the and the and the background. Huh. You know what I mean? That's that's yeah. a good. Huh? <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, you know, I was I was yeah, I was I was filled with the spirit, you know, when we did that take. Um Halloween night, nineteen ninety five. Really? Wow. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. I have a funny story to tell about that song. I don't okay. know that I talk about it in the book. I probably do. Do I talk about the chandelier? Uh you're gra you're grabbing it as you're yeah. it's like above your head and then you pull an arm off and break that's the why arm off of it, yeah. You break the arm off. That's why the official so lyrics you, or the unofficial lyrics have I broke the chandelier at the very it's last. It's in there. <laughs> yeah, if you if you turn it once the song ends, if you turn the volume way up and you be careful but this that the song after right after the last note plays, you hear the this chandelier sort of tinkling and then I say in a fairly <laughs> muted and horrified tone, I broke the chan I broke the chandelier. <laughs> But you were credited with playing the chandelier in the album. You know, yeah, I played uh, the hell out of that thing. Yeah, you did it. You did as well as yeah. it could be done, I guess. <laughs> well, it, it gave it gave up the ghost. It sacrificed <laughs> it. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's an incredible song, and um, you know that and put a lid on it. We're both from that album, and uh, you wrote both of those songs. And yeah, you know, just from reading your book, I know that. The, the band was a collective, but it, it seems like, you know, Jimbo is uh, kind of the leader and, you know, that you had this, you know, such a large hand and your star is shining so bright on these two songs. Uh, does that cause friction in, in a band that does seem like such a, you know, everyone kind of plays their part, you know? Yeah, it caused a lot of friction. And ultimately, I think it's why I left, um, because, right. you know, my... I had come up with it with sort of the um, in in the kind of environment of band as family, which I would mm -hmm. not necessarily recommend unless you can actually find you know actual family members. It, the upside of it, well, the downside of it is, is that you can get um, disappointed. The upside is that if if you do communicate or treat each other like family then you can achieve a level of intimacy in terms of musical expression that is 
that most people are not capable of. If you have bands where there's sort of a clear leader and they're not extraordinarily gifted as such, you're going to end up with that person's vision accompanied by a bunch of sullen clock punchers, you know? Right. And so the, the zippers very much started as a familial unit, but I think on some level it was always Jim and Catherine always felt like it was their thing. And then, um, the success of those two songs, I think contributed to a, a great deal of tension and friction. And I'm, I'm not going to say that I wasn't, I mean, I didn't try to take over, but like when when shit happens that quickly, it can, I think, to some degree, go to your head. And then, you know, any any band only gets about five years. So by the time I quit in June of 99, I think it, it had been a very, very good run, and I'm very proud of it. It's right. still somehow limping along, and um, uh, but that's, you know, has nothing to do with me. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Well, uh, you know, it's it's interesting because you know you I got the sense you uh, didn't have much regard for the other so-called swing revival bands of that <laughs> era. No. I'll admit, you know, I I own CDs by such artists as Royal Crown Review and the Cherry Pop and Daddies, which uh, in retrospect was maybe a name that wouldn't have gotten past the Me Too era. But um, <laughs> that's an aside. <laughs> right, well, will, right. <laughs> I, but I will right. say that even though I listened to those bands back then. It didn't have the staying power for me like Swirl Nut Z- Zippers did. And I still listen to Swirl Nut Zippers to this day. And the other ones I'll stumble across if I'm doing like an internet 90s journey or something. And then I'll listen to it and then I'll forget about it again. But like, you know, it's 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 not like in my consciousness. <laughs> As you said, it's a bit one dimensional, I guess. Well, if you do, you know, the that band, the Mountain Goats, uh-huh. John Darn. Yep. Well, mm-hmm. I'm I'm I know John and he has a great saying, which is, you know, what is it more power to all bands? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like it was even at the time it was impossible for me to say anything bad about the guys themselves. I remember we were and we were supposed to do a radio thing in Boston and they wanted us to play with one of the daddy bands. And I said, no, I won't <laughs> share a bill with them. And then I thought, fuck this. Um, this isn't going to go over well with these guys. And I don't want them to think that I'm like, that I don't like them, you know? So I called their manager and he was like, why do you hate us? And I'm like, I promise I don't, but I really hate this whole swing thing because I felt like it was a way of putting a, like a sell by date on us. You know, Mm. I didn't particularly like that music. Um, but what I really resented was the fact that we were getting sort of shoehorned into this, very limited thing that was going to be hustled off um, the stage. Um, But I think that that was inevitable once we, you know, had a top 20 hit. The goal in playing that music was to have, was to try to guarantee, was to step step outside of the limitations of of, uh, fashion, you know, of musical Mm -hmm. fashion and sort of guarantee yourself a career that you could you could do for the long haul you know and appeal to several generations um that was the stuff i loved about it and when people were like you're the latest fad i was like well we're screwed right it's not going to last and it didn't you know but i just beat against the tide there wasn't anything i could do about it but whether or not i whatever music i care for or don't care for who cares right it's it's i it it's it's a, it's an entirely subjective thing, you know? So you could listen to those bands all day, every day, and I wouldn't have a problem with it, you know? <laughs> right. And, uh, you're speaking of fashion, your, your book ends, uh, with the, uh, infamous gap ad, the khaki yeah. swing yeah. with the Louis Prima's jump, drive and whale. And, and yeah. as you kind of said, that's, that's where the whole, you know, you, you've seen Fonzie jump over the shark at this point. <laughs> And, that's right. Uh, <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's on the. It's on the. the we're, we're cresting the wave now, and and it's it's jumped the shark, and and it's kind of past its prime. So, uh, yeah, and it that, became. Yeah. And I'm sad to say, it, to I guess to some degree in popular culture, I guess maybe I'm wrong. It, you probably can answer this question with more accuracy than than I. Um, seem to become to some degree a kind of a pariah, you know. Mm. 
um, because there was a couple of years where you couldn't get away from it. Um, mm -hmm. My partner and I are rewatching, as we do, uh, all of the Harry Potter movies. And I think <laughs> the fourth one, the third one, with Lupin, Professor Lupin or whatever, he they have a, a montage scene that scene that has like a swing song in it. And this is from like the year 2000 or 2001. And I'm like, you couldn't get away from this, you know? <laughs> so I can see how people were like, oh God, okay. Um, so occasionally people will just, you know, you'll see the the snarky article about, you know, why you why we legitimately hate the swing movement or whatever and i'm like that's fine and then they may or may not carve out something for squirrel nut zippers but having said that i still have people who are like i love i love those records and i love that band we're not talking about people so much as we're talking about sort of whatever the fashion is mm -hmm. right um but that's kind of where your book ends and like i said my only complaint was that it was a little it was too short. I wanted to know more. What happens then? <laughs> so well, what happened then, man? <laughs> um, I became, I receded and largely became in the employee of my former self and then went on <laughs> and, and had a life. I mean, I quit and that, right. and that's, I quit the band and, and that, and that had its own sort of set of, you know, ramifications. And I've put out three solo records, I guess, um and played music for years and years mm -hmm. and then got uh, a second or third career as a writer you know uh, yeah, which i, I love. i've always that. loved doing yeah. what's that i was gonna ask you about that i think it's really cool that you've had this uh second life as a freelance writer as well so yeah um it's been so it's been it's such a wonderful thing to do mm -hmm. um and I, I think the first sort of serious job I had was writing for Al Jazeera America, mm. and I got on their whatever list of contributors, and then it was fine. Nothing was really happening, and then Lou Reed died, mm. and they reached out to me, and and this, and they said, "This is typical. Can you get us something like I don't know, fifteen hundred words or something in two hours?" Mm. And it was like I don't. I had a complete sort of crisis, you know, which is like, what, what business do I have, you know, writing any sort of memorial, <laughs> trying to, trying to sub, try to summarize Lou Reed's death. And I was really affected by it. I was really um, upset, but I did it, you know, I, and I wrote something and I wrote something that I think is largely still good. And they, really liked it and so what that meant was that i became the sort of fellow that rolled up and said a few words over the body you know if it was pete seeger or anybody else and it mm. gave me this it, it allowed me to develop a wonderful skill set about what is important what has this a sort of a a narrative through line in someone's life and what they contributed and i've written a lot of other things besides but um yeah i was kind of dabbling in sort of that sort of stuff back when i was in zippers but um it's a more sedentary life and one that agrees with someone of my advancing age more than being out on the road and you know <laughs> um this sort of rootless the rootless life of a touring musician, which I always loved performing, but man, I never, I never liked touring that much, which is, doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but right. If I, if I could, if I had access to a teleporter, I'd probably still be performing. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. But, um, well, I, uh, I know they're not ready yet, but is there anything you can tell us about your podcast series or your new book that you want to say now, or do you want to keep that under your hat? A couple of, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I can give you like, uh, the book is called, uh, well, the working title now is A Really Strange and Wonderful Time, and it's about coming up in Chapel Hill, being a part of the Chapel Hill music scene in the 1990s. So it is um, takes place between 1989 and 1999, but it's not autobiography. I'm a character in it, but it's really making a case for the genius of community, 
Um, it's sort of riffing on this idea that Brian Eno had about what he called genius, which is the genius of community. So it's not just, and and I get to talk to all of these wonderful musicians that I knew at the time and still have the pleasure of knowing. And this is the guys in Polvo and Archers of Loaf and Super Chunk, um, as well as Squirrel Nut Zippers and Ben Folds Five and all of these really sort of remarkable bands that came out of that time and place. And I'm talking about the community that allowed that to happen, you know, which is, I think, an appropriate tribute um, to a time and place. And it's not, and so I'm talking about college radio stations and clubs like the Cat's Cradle and things like that. And, and it's kicking my ass and I'm having a great time writing it and I'm going to continue writing it through the first quarter. And I think it's, it's going to come out, let's say spring of 24. That sounds about right. Something like mm -hmm. that. And the podcast is based on, um, a, an, a, a, a series of essays I wrote for long reads but it's way better because I'm doing it with my partner, Brooklyn, and it's called Shelved. And it's about records that were shelved. We do mm. not have an air date yet, but um, probably late spring, it's cool. going to come out on, on, on Audible. Nice. And I'll give, well, let's just say that there are a whole lot of very, very interesting records that either did not come out at all or came out much later after they were recorded. And some of them will come as a complete shock uh, to people. Um, mm. But I'm not quite ready to give the game away yet. One, well, one I will. We did one on um, Yoko Ono's solo record that she made when she and John Lennon were separated. And it never came out. Not never. It came out 20 years. 20 years after it was recorded. That's an amazing story. So that, like I said, that podcast is called Shelved. Because I'm doing it with Brooklyn, it's way more interesting, fun, insightful. We, we do interviews. We obviously are able to license music. It's just a whole other animal from the essays that I wrote for Long Reads. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm looking forward to both of those. That's awesome. Um, well, uh, Thank you so much again for taking all this time. Uh, the Zoom machine tells me I've got uh, two minutes and 43 seconds left. But yeah. um, the question I always ask at the end is, what music have you been listening to lately? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, generally speaking, I have become, weirdly, a really big fan of Baroque viola da gamba music. So people like Marin Murray, Sir de Saint-Colombe, uh, Carl Friedrich Abel. Uh, it's very sort of meditative and beautiful stuff. That's what I would recommend to people is the Harp Sonata by Jermaine Tolliver. I, I guess I've been listening to classical music a lot. A lot of Eric Satie, who I just love. Mm -hmm. And um, sort of oddball stuff. Now that it's winter time, everybody should run out and buy a record called Jas Svenska by this guy Jan Johansson. Uh, it's it means jazz in Swedish. Mm. It's a record that he made between 1962 and 1964, which is where he takes 300-year-old Swedish fiddle folk songs and arranges them for jazz piano and stand-up bass. And boy, is it, it's a, it's an absolute masterpiece. Um, wow. it's, it's austere as befits the season. It's, it's a little playful. It's, it's fantastic stuff. So Excellent. yeah, put you, put your ears on that. I will for sure. Well, uh, thank you again. This has uh, been a complete honor and I hope that you come back and we talk some more. I've got, so much more I could talk to you about. I could <laughs> go on for hours, but uh, I'm sure that <laughs> you wouldn't want to. <laughs> so, <laughs> You'd be but, surprised. Uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be glad to come back, and I and I appreciate the interest, and and I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Great. Well, uh, have a good rest of your night here. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Rob. Good night. Bye. -bye.